This is Corolla Digital. Socrates, Buddha, Lombardi, great teachers, mentors, and coaches throughout history. Joined now by Adam Carolla. Don't do your best, do my best. Time to be motivated, inspired, and get wise. It's time to take a knee. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice but to get on. Get on. Welcome to our inspirational, motivational podcast. It's um, Take a Knee. And uh, Ryan Holiday, a friend of the show, is uh, back. And uh, we love Ryan. And uh, the book, Lives of the Stoics, available for pre order now on Amazon. It's coming out uh, September 29th. Oh, so tomorrow, as you hear this. So uh, I don't know. Why don't you just wait till tomorrow and get it on Amazon? Uh, Ryan's 10th book and uh, second appearance on this show. Good to see you, Ryan. Yeah, thanks. It's an honor. <laughs> I was uh, reminded, uh, somebody said, uh, Ryan, Ryan Holiday, that's the guy who thinks you're a stoic. And I went, oh, yeah, I like that guy. Because <laughs> sure. why wouldn't you like anyone who thinks you're a stoic? Uh, yeah, now more than ever, man, we need some stoicism. What is going on in our society? I cannot figure out what's happened to dudes. And first things first, is stoicism a uniquely male thing, or is it a more male thing, or is there such a thing as stoic women as well? There's definitely stoic women. I think, you know, we make the word stoic in English, we call, we call this lowercase stoicism, just means has no emotions. I think uppercase stoicism the philosophy is a genderless thing but it's about taking control of your own life it's about not being afraid it's about doing the right thing it's uh, it's funny though like marcus aurelius who's sort of the most famous stoic i mean he lived uh, we think this pandemic's gone on a long time he lived through 15 years of what we now call the antonine plague so uh, hmm. i don't know if that's a a forecast of what's to come. But the idea of stoicism being sort of enduring and surviving and not being broken by something like uh, what we're going through now is certainly historically based. Well, let's talk about how a stoic, at least in your estimation, but you're, you're the expert in this conversation. How would a stoic, and let's just say living in Los Angeles, because there's probably a difference between living in Wuhan and living in New Jersey, and and or, and or living in you know I don't know d- d- deep deep uh, corners of Idaho. Uh, let's just say living in Los Angeles. What would a stoic's head be on this pandemic? How would they con- conduct themselves? What would they do regarding others, regarding themselves? What do you think a a straight stoic approach to this pandemic would be? So if we if we look at Marcus Aurelius as an example, so the first thing he does is he brings in like the best experts of the time and he actually listens to them. You know, he sort of makes the hard, hard decisions. But then at the same time, he still continues to go about his life. So in, in most of the rich Romans sort of flee Rome at this time. They don't know what's causing the, the plague or how to prevent it. So they flee. But Marcus stays, you know, he, he sort of stays and does, does the job. So he's a little bit like sort of Churchill during the Blitz. Like, you're mm-hmm. not going to break my spirit. You're not going to make me cower. I guess I, I, I think, uh, you know, the modern Stoic would sort of listen to the advice uh, would accept the parts of it that are outside of their control, and then they'd focus on, you know, what they can do inside of it. So they certainly wouldn't be wasting a lot of time, I don't know, on Twitter or on, you know, the Internet being really angry about it. They'd just sort of do what they have to do. Does a stoic process info and let's see if I can figure out a way to word this. I, uh, I was going to Texas a few months ago and I talked to my sister on the phone and I was like going to the airport or something. And she said like, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to Texas. And she said, what, why are you going to Texas? And I said, cause I'm doing a show. 
And she said, what are you doing traveling? Like, why, why do you want to travel? Or aren't you scared to travel? And I just said, I don't know. I, I never gave it any thought. I just, there was a gig in Texas and I'm going to Texas. That's as far as I got with it. Sure. And my take is if the airlines are open and if the club is open in Texas, then it's okay for me to travel. That's as far as I, I, I didn't even get any further with it than that. Like there's an airplane it's open, the airport's open, and there's one that goes to Texas. That That's as far as I got with it. I guess, but are, aren't you, uh, isn't isn't the, the basically the core conceit of, of most of your comedy that people are stupid and uh, don't do the rational, smart thing? I, so I guess what I'm saying is the fact that, that some people are doing something, it's for me not a, uh, uh, evidence that it's a good idea. Well... My take is everything is exceedingly safe in, in the sense that we err on the side of safety. I, sure. I I can't imagine a big commercial airliner or a big commercial airline saying it's OK for our equipment to go from L.A. to Texas if they didn't figure it out. Like, I don't trust them. I, I don't think they're smart per se. But I know Los Angeles. Los Angeles is like if there's a 2% chance of anything going wrong, we shut it down. And the fact that it's open, the fact that I can go to LAX, walk through LAX and get on an airplane suggests that the super hypersensitive scared people who are in charge of shutting everything down all the time left it open. That That's one piece. Sure. The, the other piece is generally low self-esteem. Like, uh, so what? I'll get on a plane. Well, aren't you scared? Well, what if you get sick? Uh, then I'll get sick. Like, that. that's, I'll get sick if I get sick. That's the way I, I look at it. I'll have to go home and then lay down. Like, once right. I get sick, that's the way I look at it. So, and when you think about how I think of people being dumb, my feeling with people being dumb is most women when they have three-year-old kids running around, leave the pool gate open, but slap the tap water out of the hand of the kid who's drinking tap water because it wasn't passed through a Brita filter. Meanwhile, the pool gate's open and they're watching TV. That's, right. that's how I think. They don't, they don't assess. There's two bodies of water here. One possesses no danger. That's you drinking municipal water. The other is your kid will be dead in 90 seconds and you've left the gate open and you're going upstairs. That's true. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, like for me, the the, the one my wife and I spent a lot of time thinking about was uh, like sending our kid back to daycare or school. And, you know, the fact that the Texas school board decided that this was a good idea to me is not that's not a body or an authority that I you know, believe makes particularly good judgment calls about things where uh, the risk is very low. So the idea that they'd be able to successfully parse, you know, a complicated, unprecedented, you know, geopolitical medical crisis strikes me as, uh, you know, probably not a not a good a good bet. Well, I would factor this in as well, which is Texas, Florida, other places that are much more apt to open things versus California, which is sure. much more apt to close things. So if you said to me, go into that restaurant in Texas, it's open. I would think to myself, would that same restaurant be closed if it was in California? That's and, true. And now I'm going to factor that into going. I would go into the restaurant anyway. But my point is, is like there is something if if Gavin Newsom of California says you shall now be it is now safe to go into the restaurant, that means you could have done it five months ago safely. He just right. shut it down for an extra five. Like if he says it's safe, that means zero chance of anything ever because he's not going to open it and tell it. So, yes, I would say factor in a bunch of a bunch of factors before going to the airport. Your, your point about people like sort of looking at the wrong crisis is a is an interesting one. I, I remember a few months ago I, out of my the front of my office window, I, my office is like a storefront. I was looking at the, the sort of old timey diner across the street and I watched a guy walk in. He's open carrying. He's got two extra clips on his belt, uh, but then refusing to, to wear a mask. And this is when it was really bad in Texas. And so 
you know, it struck me as this guy's prepared for the incredibly unlikely event of a mass shooting breaking out in his uh, in the restaurant where he's going to need to shoot 32 rounds of ammunition. Uh, but but the, uh, you know, the mask that he could put on to prevent himself from getting a very real virus that is, you know, currently uh, ravaging the community. So I think people it's like, you know, you have people who are very concerned about covid, but meanwhile, eat terribly and have taken care of themselves horribly for a really long time. And then you have people who are super healthy and, you know, are terrified that they might. So it's it's, people are good at, at sort of seeing how these things are interrelated with each other. Well, this is a very good point, which is sort of we have trouble with priorities. Yeah. And I always want to work big to small. And it's funny when I interviewed uh, our governor, Gavin Newsom here, he explained to me he wanted to work small to big. And I thought, I don't want anyone in charge working small to big. I know that's the whole point of being in charge. I know it sounds good, but it doesn't make any fucking sense. Work big, a homeless problem, and then get down to an individual situation who uh, is having a problem with the city and their address painted on their curb illegally or something like that. The point is that this 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 priority situation. I was thinking about it. I was watching the news today and I was seeing, you know, helicopter footage of some poor guy in a Prius. Once in a while, somebody just goes down the wrong street. They run into the big mob that's at the end of the street. And then the person was like trying to turn right and kind of just get by it. But there were like people in their way. And they scooted by, but the crowd didn't like it, you know, chased the car and was going to kill the person. But I thought to myself, I and I was also looking at this Kyle Rittenhouse or Rittenhour. I can't remember his name. I was looking at this. I've been studying this, which is so there's three things I've been looking at. People standing in front of cars and like jumping up on the hood of cars where someone is in that car driving that car and their foot is on the accelerator. Like you're panicking these people. They're liable just to punch it. And you're standing on their hood. Like, I I don't know. You're playing pretty fast and loose with the scared soccer mom by you standing in front of the minivan because she's liable to punch it and you're liable to just go under the minivan. But there doesn't seem to be a fear of that. Kyle Rittenauer, that kid blew someone away with an AR-15 or M-16 <coughs> written house, sorry. And then a mob chased him and then whacked him over the head. And he like turned around and blew another guy away. And then the third guy was like, Hey man, no problem. And then he started and then he blew his arm off. Like, hello, the guy has a high powered rifle. Give him a little, give him a little birth people. Give him a little space. He's got a, he just shot someone 18 seconds ago. That guy's dead. Then he shot another guy. That guy's dead. The third guy's like, I'm going in. Like, really? You fucking got- Okay. He's killed two guys with that gun in under 20 seconds. You're going in? I don't know. I'd give him a little room. And uh, you're going to get in front of the cop and start fucking point wagging your finger and pu- punching the cop in the chest and stuff. Where is the fear? All out fear of coronavirus. Right. Not so much of a fear of a running automobile in front of you and a panicked mom behind the wheel or a 17 year old with a long rifle. I'm, I'm just like, where, where's the fear priority? No, that's a, yeah, that's an interesting point. Although it's like sort of what the hell is this kid doing with a, an assault rifle in a town that he doesn't live in protecting property that he doesn't know? Don't want to get political, not defending him. Still want to know why people are chasing a guy with a gun who just shot somebody. Well, people are just bad at, I think, risk it. Like, so you people will go like, well, I'm already doing X, so I should be able to do all these other like they don't get how risk compounds either. Right. So it's like, well, I'm, I'll hear this from people. We're already sending our kids to school, let's say. So we're also going to go on vacation and then we're also going to do this. We're also going to do that. If society could could be somewhat rational and go like, here's our, here are five big priorities. Like we got to have the warehouses operating. Uh, you know, we've got to have uh, schools operational. We got to have this and this, and then everything else is less important than that. You could, 
like when you even look at some of the phase one, two, three opening plans, it's like, they're like day one, let's open all movie theaters. And that's right. like the 50th least important thing. You, like we're opening movie theaters at 50% capacity and bars when it's like you could drink at home, but then schools are like way down the line. And then it's like, of course, school is now potentially dangerous. It's because, people are doing these other things that they, they don't need to be doing. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't, you know, it, it's bizarre. The prior prioritizing as we spoke to is kind of, it, it, it's bad when there's not a rhyme or a reason, you know, it's and then bad. people don't trust it because they think that it's bullshit. Well, it yeah, we had that in LA when they kept like scolding people for being on the beach and stuff. It's like, that's not, what's dangerous about being on the beach. And so it's like when, once you start overplaying that hand, then people go, ah, fuck it. We're going into the bar or, or whatever it is. And it's very true. And there's, there's a lot of that going on right now where people are sort of using a lot of hyperbole. And so people are sort of having to round it down or add a little flour to their gravy kind of step on it or cut it, you know, you know, you hear breaking news, you know, and some story about Trump and then there's breaking news and there's a story about Hunter Biden. And it's like, all right, I, it, you know, I, we're at, we're at this hyperbole phase of life, but it's, I think it's burning out people's senses. Oh, totally. So, so it's like, let's say, let's say somebody says something that's in bad taste or, you know, was, was stupid or even let's, 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 we're even conceding that it was, it was done, you know, uh, done with bad intent. You know, they're not like, Hey, that was a shitty thing to say. Uh, we don't, we're not going to have people like that in, you know, positions of leadership or whatever, you know, it's, it's now like you did violence to me or you have to apologize for the harm that was done to me. One of the really essential tenets of stoicism is that people can't inflict harm on you. Like you, we decide what's harmful and not harmful. So like yes. Epictetus goes, when you're offended, you have to understand that you're complicit because you chose to be offended. They said what they said, that that's, that's on them. But then you decide to say to yourself, I have been, a, a wrong has been inflicted upon me by your words. And so what, after enough time of people being told that, you know, uh, like uh, there was this college professor that that got uh, got in trouble because he said a word in Mandarin that sounds like the N word. Right. And was, you know, people are like, you've done harm to me. It's like you could have a reasonable discussion about how that caught you off guard. But certainly no harm was done to you unless you chose to see it that way. Well, obviously, there's there's kind of let's say there's three settings you could wish for for your children. Uh, how about we just do it this way? You could wish that they are on the far setting of words in Mandarin, which essentially were sort of shorthand for OK or um, I hear you or yeah, right, right, right. Sound like the N word. OK, so one setting could be that's wildly offensive. I don't care what the context is. I don't care who said it. Uh, it sounded enough like this word, and that's enough for me to be triggered and, and offended. That that would be one setting. I right. think we can all agree we don't want our kids to be in that setting because that's a that's a miserable life. That's of course. that's you walking around with your head on a swivel looking to be offended. So, all right, that's like someone who's sunburned when they walk outside, no matter right. what the temperature right. is. So we can all coverage. agree we don't want that for our children. Then there's a kind of middle setting, which is uh, I'm not easily offended. But if someone wags their finger in my face and calls me an asshole, then maybe I will be offended. Uh, I'm not going to make I'm not going to find reasons to be offended out of whole cloth. You know, if somebody puts their hand on my shoulder when I'm walking away, I'm not going to say I was assaulted. But <laughs> if somebody calls me a douche on Twitter, then maybe I'll be offended. And then there's a third setting. And the third setting would be, hey, so-and-so was talking about you today on so-and-so's podcast, and it wasn't, it wasn't very kind. Do you want to hear it? No. 
I'm in no mode. I'm the third setting. I'm the yeah. I'm the hey, uh, you know, Jimmy Kimmel was calling you crazy on Howard Stern the other day. You want to hear it now? I'm good. I like Jimmy. I like Howard. Whatever they said, they said. I didn't want to know what it is. Now, I don't know if that's a wiring. I don't know if you have to get there. I don't know if you strive. I'm literally, it's not that I'm curious and I resist. It's I don't want to know. I don't want to hear it. Somebody tweeted me the uh, the file of it, and I didn't, all I had to do was hit play, and I didn't hit it. I just went on to the next tweet. It's, I actively don't, it's like saying, it's like saying, oh, look at you. You have, you have so much willpower not to eat that chocolate cake. And I go, I don't like chocolate cake. It's not willpower. I don't want it. Right. Sure. So do you, uh, do you, have you thought about how you teach that? I, I've never thought it, about how you teach it. Yeah. I don't know how it is either. I remember one time when I was at American Apparel, I, I, uh, my emails got hacked as part of this, uh, there was this lawsuit and someone hacked into my emails and they leaked it. And I, of course, you know, what you say privately in emails, you never want someone to see. <laughs> and I remember that my boss was like, yeah, I don't give a shit. He's like, I know what I say in emails to people. I wouldn't want someone to hold it against me. So I think there's also an element of, of kind of the golden rule of it where it's like you wouldn't want someone else to be a, to, to, to sort of probe or be overly sensitive to it. And so you kind of have to hold yourself to that standard, too. Yeah. So how... Now, you really don't want to be in the I'm offended for the sake of being offended mode. Um, for me, it feels like a calorie burner. It doesn't feel e- efficient to me. It feels mm. like a waste of energy and time. So for you to – so if I'm the uh, mayor of Oakland and I see – ropes hanging from the tree in the park and there's a loop at the end of the rope and somebody says i think that may be a noose i then go all right let me see what it is and then i talk to the black man who hung the ropes up and he said no we all use it to work out then i go all right i'm done the mayor of oakland says we're moving forward with the investigation and i go Okay, that's resources. You're you're burning time and money. These guys could look into real hate crimes. No, no. I'm not going to I'm not going to be deterred by this person saying this isn't what this is. I'm going to move forward. Now, to me, all that sounds like is a wild waste of time, energy and resources to me. So, going in, back and being offended or trying to find things to be offended, that sounds like a calorie burner. It does, but it is weird about our society. Like I I I I get that. It's like we we tend whether it's with Me Too or the racial justice stuff, we'll, we'll swing too far in the opposite direction now where, like, every rope is a noose and, and uh, every, you know, every word is an is a act of violence. But then it's also what, what we don't do a good job talking about is that, like, okay, so now you have the mayor of Oakland, you know, exaggerating uh, a noose, let's say. I don't know this example. But it's, like, the law of the land for 150 years up until relatively recently was, like, they would actually lynch a person with the rope and then the mayor would be like, oh, that's just some guys burning off some steam. So right. it's like we have this weird like or with me, too. You're like, OK, now are we saying that every bad date is sexual harassment? Obviously, that's not going to work. But then it's like people were like Harvey Weinstein is raping me. And everyone's like, uh, how can we trust you? You're an unreliable actress. So like how I, I don't get why we have to swing from one far end of the pendulum to the other. It's so strange. Yeah, we have to swing as far as it takes, which is, uh, for me, I do a fair amount of engineering things, uh, building things, building structures and staircases and roll cages and cars, and there's a lot of engineering. I end up, I've done a lot of engineering in my career. Sure. And my thing that I always tell people is anybody could take a bunch of big timbers and lag bolt them to the wall and build the shit out of something. But if you over engineer it, you're not really engineering. Like if you're if you're if you're overdoing it, sure. if, if if the 
you can build a house that would withstand a 11.0 earthquake, but it's unnecessary and you're overbuilding, like you're overdoing it. Engineering is getting right up to the point where it's necessary and then stopping. And that's kind of my feeling with the social thing, which is go up to the point, you know, don't have it just swing back all the way the other way. Now you're over engineering this thing. Um, come back to the point where, if it was a news, then do an investigation. If it turns out to just be a hand grab for guys working out in the park, then go find a real news. Right. Otherwise, we're going past and over engineering everything. Well, so for the Stoics, this the, and I think we talked about this last time, but the the virtue of moderation or temperance was really about finding that midpoint. So Aristotle famously goes, "Look, you obviously don't want someone to be a coward, but if somebody has no fear." they may actually be more dangerous and a bigger liability to an army than a person who has too much fear. And so that courage is actually a midpoint between those two extremes or somebody who's, you know, incredibly selfish and paranoid, you know, like a total, uh, you know, penny pincher. And then somebody who just gives every dollar away, like in the midpoint between that is someone who's generous, who values money, you know, just the right amount or whatever. So the idea of, of these things being a midpoint between virtues is, I think, an, an underrated idea. I, I think even politically, uh, the, I love the idea that the, the Republicans are trying to present uh, Biden as this radical leftist. Meanwhile, the left is convinced that he's like a, uh, uh, a soulless moderate, but actually moderation is like the key virtue of our political system. Like yeah. moderates are the people we should be electing, not crazy people on either side. You know, the thing about moderation is it's not exciting, you know, and we're, we're right. living at a point where we want thrills everywhere. So we don't, we don't look for moderation. We don't, we never praise moderation all the attention, you know, if you have three kids and one kid's a junkie strung out on fentanyl, they get all the attention. And if the other kid is a world-class pianist, then they get the attention. The kid in the middle who's taking a few units at the junior college and keeping his nose clean, that kid gets no attention, you know? So all the focus of society goes on to that one or that one. And if you want to just ride it down the middle... You're never going to lead the news. You never. You don't get that attention. You know, if you think about it, all we, you know, politicians, they always talk about, you know, the single mom without insurance with the three kids who barely struggling to get by. And then the rich fat cat from Silicon Valley's got the private jet. Really, the middle is no fun for anyone. And I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know how to how to bring it back you know, how to get the focus to the middle because the middle is where most everyone lives. Well, it's like, I think social media drives a lot of this, right? So it's like you watch a video on social media of the police abusing someone or, and then, then you watch people protesting that. And then you watch the police abusing those people. And, and so you're, you're, you're seeing this on social media. There are these super viral, awful images. The response isn't, like, hey, let's have a long form, complicated discussion about how we solve this problem. It's abolish the police or, you know, uh, abolish ICE. And it's like, I don't think the solution to police abusing people is for there to be zero police. Like, the, obviously, the solution is somewhere between a police state and no police. And yeah. that, that just, but if you were to say that, not only is that not viral, Actually, the crazy people on both sides will get really mad at you as yeah. because you're now making them look crazy. Well, a uh, couple thoughts. One is uh, one of the statements that has been, come to fore over the last few years that always drove me nuts is a zero tolerance. We have zero tolerance for smoke or kids or abuse or whatever. It's like I, you've announced You've announced that your hotel has zero tolerance for smoking or something like that. But it's like people still light a cigarette in their room, you know, but you've you've announced to the heavens zero tolerance. So uh, zero tolerance is always going to come back and bite you in the ass because it's sort of impossible when you're talking about kids being left behind or kids being hungry. You know, you just have a zero. 
you, you've announced that you have a zero tolerance for everything that's bad. <laughs> and it's like, all right, thank you, uh, hero. But if you think about it, and if you look at it this way, and I've never really pictured it this way, but it's very true. If you're having a battle and you have one group who's on one side in, entrenched, literally in, in trenches, and then you have another group on the other side, 150 yards away, and they're, they're trenched up, then the most dangerous place to be is in the middle. Right. And, no man's land. And people think, well, isn't the most dangerous place to be on the losing side of the whatever? But this is a battle that never ends, and there's no real loser. So you don't want to be Kevin Costner on a horse going down the middle. You're just going to get shot by both sides. Right. That, that's basically what, what happens to the moderates. You get you get it from both sides. Much better off just joining your uh, – your, your, your um, I'm trying your MAGA people or your or your or your Antifa people on on this side. It's oh, well, it's, it's certainly safer. No, that that's right, and and or it's just like let me just uh, not have any opinions at all, and that way I can't ever piss anyone off. Which is, and I think what ends up happening too is like it's like uh, this, the metaphor is probably getting a little tortured, but it's like then the two sides are trying to go further and further away from each other so that uh, the other side looks more extreme. So there's right. this, it's like a constant escalation where the stuff, you know, it's like, Hey, we should have police reform. And it's like, no, actually I believe we should have no police whatsoever. And then someone's else like, I think we should, you know, like whatever the, it, it becomes this arms race of who can have the most extreme views because the other, because the other views are now starting to sound, like views that just a few years ago were were fairly uh you know progressive are now considered you know uh regressive so it, it, it everyone has to constantly be exaggerating yeah it's a weird uh, it's a weird time to be alive i i have personally found that all of this stuff only exists to the extent that you let it exist Mm -hmm. If you simply, I mean, everyone kind of knows it in a micro way where I go out on the road and I go out for a few days and I do some shows and I don't bring a laptop with me. I have my phone, but my phone's not very well connected. And so it's like no Twitter for you know, a couple of two, three days, you know, I have no idea what's going on. Uh, the news is like, I, you know, come home after the show, watch sports center for 20 minutes, go to bed, you know, like, I don't really know what's going on. And, uh, the second it's gone, like it's, 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 it's like some really bad relationship and, and you guys broke up and you're like, Oh, I don't miss this person. Like I, 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 I don't long for it. Like it just, it just leaves and it leaves. It's not really like, it's not like a diet where you go like no pizza. And then after three days, you go, you're watching a commercial on, on, for Pizza Hut and you go, fuck, I want some pizza. Like you, you right. don't feel that way. Like it just kind of, you know, it's like, hey, you want to hear what uh, Jimmy and Howard Stern were saying about you? It's like, no. Nah. And then like a day later, it's as if it never, it never happened. It's, it's pretty easy to get there if, if you, if you want. I don't know. I don't know why more so. people don't want to get there. Well, it's like if you look at the things that people were really upset about in December and January and February, they seem like preposterously quaint. Right. In retrospect, you're like, what? Like, sure. You know, there was like a speaking of airlines. I remember there was a scandal. Maybe it was Delta was a big thing about whether, you know, they were going to put in a thing that prevented people from reclining their seats on airplanes. Oh, yeah. And then someone was like pushing on the seat over and over yeah. again. And then it's like three days later, it's like, are we ever going to be able to fly again? Because now there's a global pandemic. So it's like so much of the things we get really worked up on not only didn't matter at the time, but they definitely don't matter when life intervenes. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, first things first, we, the ultimate extreme is essentially death or laying in your hospital bed preparing to die. Like then then what? How much right. of what matters then? So if you get to that kind of ultimate position of I'm just laying here with a bunch of tubes coming out of me and, the, the, you know, the priest has delivered the last rites, then what 
what are you outraged by? What are you concerned with? Like, where, where are you at then? And so we're all sort of somewhere in between birth and that, you know? Sure. <laughs> I guess that's technically true. And so we shouldn't be that surprised. Like, I mean, we shouldn't, we shouldn't bite that hard at it. We shouldn't, we shouldn't, we shouldn't sort of, it, I, I feel like Charlie Brown going for the football and Lucy's holding it. You know what I mean? Like we shouldn't run at it as hard as we run at it each time. And we know that ball gets pulled away at the last second and we go ass over uh, tea, uh, ass over coffee table onto the ground. So like, but yet, so many people just run at that ball every single time. And to me, in a weird way, I've never thought about this, but that's more like an animal. You know what I mean? Like like you yeah. say, like I take my dog and, you know, I have the tennis ball and I do the pump fake and the dog does the turn and then comes back and then I just do it again. You know what I mean? Like uh, that's how animals yeah. work. Like you have a ball in your hand, you're pretending to throw it. Uh, you've done it six times. I'm kind of ignoring the first five. Y- you know what I mean? Like, yeah, that is how an that's how a dog thinks. Well, so the Stoics like that idea of of death being a, a sort of an immediate perspective giver. My, one of my favorite quotes from Marcus Aurelius: He goes, "Are you afraid of death because you won't be able to do blank anymore?" And just as a kind of sentence to go through your day where you're like, oh, yeah, like, I don't want to die. I want to live forever. But my life actually consists of like all this bullshit that I actually hate doing. And and so I, it's like, do you are you afraid to die because you won't be able to argue on Twitter about shit that doesn't matter anymore? No. So why are you arguing on Twitter? You can just not do that. Right. It's a it's a very good perspective. Like It's a good way to look at at it like you should probably start eliminating some of those activities for lack of a better term that you wouldn't miss if you were dead you know yes and like i i don't want to die because i like spending time with my kids and i like you know swimming in the pool like there's a bunch of things that make life worth living those are good reasons to you know want to be healthy and safe and smart and successful but that's weirdly not where most of our mental and physical energy goes. It's like the amount of people that are like, I don't want to, like, I got cancer. I'm so scared. And it's like, well, why are you still showing up at this horrible job that you hate every day? Right. Yeah. It's in, it's, and you wonder how much, so how much of life is kind of martyrdom, which is like, everyone's guilty of it. And I am as well, where you just go, oh, God, I got this happen again. It's such a pain in the ass. And I'm oh, such a, I don't want to do it. You know, and it's like, well, then why are you doing it? Or why are you having the same argument that never seems to get settled and then sort of complaining about it because it's not going to change? So what's attractive about this discussion or this argument? Yeah, or I, I forget who said it, but there's a great quote where it's like the first sign of an impending nervous collapse is the belief that your work is terribly important. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's like if you're taking like you can take the job seriously, but it's like when you take yourself seriously, that's a sign of insanity. And so I think a lot of like a lot of what we're seeing, whether it's online or, in, you know, a lot of the things we're talking about is just people who have appointed themselves like the arbiters or the enforcers of X, Y and Z. And that this is like a terribly important societal obligation that they're carrying on. And it's like, if you stop doing this, no one would notice because it doesn't matter at all. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's an interesting balancing act of participating in society, being aware of the, the rules and the customs and and so on and so forth of society, but kind of having one foot outside of it and not buying in to every event, calamity, every now, because society wants you to buy in. You know what I mean? The news wants you to buy in. Madison Avenue wants you to buy in. You know, when they start talking about antibacterial soap or, you know, when they start showing you 
computer-generated germscapes on the countertops of your bathroom, Lysol wants you to buy in, you know? So how do you live in a world where it's like, I see the commercial, I understand it's nice to have a clean countertop, but I'm not going to run out and buy hazmat suit. Like, so in, in a way, we, we are, you know, the people that I, I think we all appreciate and even look up to in our society are the people that buy in enough to take care of business and and succeed in whatever this culture is in 2020, but not so much that it chews them up and spits them out. I think that's right. I mean, your your point about sort of having one foot in and one foot out. Uh, I mean, I, obviously, I know your career. I sort of try to think about it in mine. Sometimes maybe the problem is like people are so imbalanced, right? Like all they do is play professional basketball and 100 percent of their identity is tied up in it. So they can't even comprehend a reality where they're not still doing that. Meanwhile, if they'd been a bit more diversified as far as their interests or their identities or their talents go, they wouldn't have to take it so seriously. So that's like, I just try to think about like, you know, right now I write books. That's what I do. That's how I make money. But like, there's 50 other things I could do. So, you know, you're not going to, you don't have me by the balls just because you get to green light, whether I get a book deal or not. Yeah. Well, man, diversity, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's interesting because everyone sort of realizes that financially it's good to have a diverse portfolio. You know, you want right. some in Apple and some in power and municipalities or whatever. Fine. I, I get it. And then there is a diversity as it pertains to employment. I feel the same way, like write a book, do a show, do a podcast, make a documentary, you know, just have some diversity there. And, and also one thing that always, um, one thing that I always thought was interesting that Dr. Drew always said was the diversity biologically was good. The the mutts were always stronger than the purebreds, you know. Hybrid vigor. Right. And 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 I, it was like is there a nature version of diversity? You know, is there is there there's a there's a natural nature sort of animal kingdom version of it? And then there's also a kind of a spiritual version of it. And then there's like a financial version of it. So maybe it's good. I think so. And I also think, too, like the more like to me, success is uh, autonomy. So like if you're making more and more money or whatever, but you're more and more dependent on one thing or one organization or institution or whatever, you're becoming more successful, but you're actually becoming more vulnerable. So like. For me, as I try to make this, I try to become more, have more independence. So, you know, obviously, like, like, uh, let's say some of the controversial things you said recently, if you were still on radio, the, that they would have more say over your life than they do now. And, and like, that's something I've thought about. It's like, okay, if you're an author and you sell a book to a publisher who sells it to a bookstore, who then sells it to a customer you're like three or four layers removed from the people who actually like you. And those, then those people in between get to decide whether you get to keep doing what you're doing or not. But then if you have a direct relationship with those people via a podcast or you self publish some stuff or whatever it is, now you, you might be, even if you're selling less copies, you actually are more successful because you're more in control of your own destiny. Yeah. I think the, the the fewer people who get to vote on your life, the, the better off yeah. you're going to be because your vote counts as one. Now, maybe your vote counts as one and maybe your publisher's vote counts as one. But if, if your publisher and you're this and your supervisor and you're that and your manager and that and you got a bunch of votes, their vote's going to outvote you. You know, yeah. and so if you think about how many votes do you want to give away, like each each time you sort of sign a contract and go, OK, you got me, you're giving away some votes. You know, it doesn't doesn't mean it's a bad thing. I've had plenty of contracts and gotten paid, but it does mean you're giving away some votes. 
Yeah, right. And uh, and it's like if you're doing that strategically, it makes total sense. But if like you're like it'd be so much harder to blacklist someone today. Like we talk about people getting canceled, but it's really it's like impossible to be canceled in 2020 because you can all if if what you're talking about actually does have a potential audience, uh, you're always going to be able to have access to that. So I'm somewhat, you know, people are like, well, I said this, you know, thing and now everyone's canceling me. It's like, well, let's, let's let the market decide whether, you know, you actually, uh, you actually have an audience or not, or is it just that the people at CBS are tired of your shit and, uh, you put all your eggs in one basket. Well, you know, it's something for me, and maybe this is part of my stoicism, but it's probably more just low self-esteem, I would assume. It's hard to tell where those two things intersect. But at the very beginning of my career, before I even had a career, I had a roommate who was sending out headshots and resumes, and he was on the – we rented a house – and a bunch of dudes living in a house, struggling. You know, he was bartending. I was swinging a hammer. And I walk in one mo- one Saturday morning, and he was just sitting at the dining room table with a bunch of manila envelopes and his headshots and resume and a book from Samuel French, the bookstore. Uh, Samuel French is a bookstore that you could get movie scripts, and it was like like an actor's bookstore, you know. Okay. And um, I don't even know if they're around anymore. But see, see if Samuel French is uh, still around, Emmy. Um, and it was like, I don't know, if you're an actor and you needed to get a play or whatever, or they probably had books on acting. But anyway, he had a book of like the addresses and the names of like all all the managers and all the agents, you know, yeah. and it, like a directory. And I was like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm sending my headshot. <laughs> He wasn't that good looking a guy. And I'm sending my resume. The resume, look, he's bartending. You know what I mean? Like, there's not yeah. much on his resume. And I'm sending my, you know, the resume says I do a British and a Cockney accent, you know, on it, right? And I can ride horse, uh, English style and Western style, you know? So, and he's he's sending them off. And, I, and I'm like, well, what are you doing? He's like, I'm trying to get an agent. And, oh, Samuel French closed March. 31st, 2019. Well, at least the pandemic didn't get him. So, and I remember just looking at him going, who's going to open this envelope, see your big mug on it, turn it over, see that you can fight with a sword and go, I want to represent this guy. You know, I was like, how's that even going to work? I don't think it's going to work. And I don't think it ever did work, but I never got a headshot and sent it to anybody. I was like, people... Certainly, they're not going to like you based on your headshot or your your cooked up resume. If you're going to get a job in this town, you better go blow someone away. Like, you better go be funny as shit on the radio show. You better have him go, that fucking guy's funny. He's coming back. You know what I mean? Like, there's no way. No one's going to see you and go, that kid's got it. It's never going to work. So who's going to like you? Nobody. My parents didn't really like me. So I was like, oh, well, if they don't like you, then why is the strange agent guy going to like you? I bet he's not. So, But he will like you if you're funny as shit and you feel like you could make him some money. Well, I get that a lot. Of people email and you probably get this too, where they're like, hey, will you be my mentor? I want to be successful in comedy or podcast or whatever, which is totally missing the point. Like, uh, the mentee or whatever you call it does not ask for the mentor. The mentor identifies the person with talent and begins to slowly give them some of their time. Like you, you don't choose to be chosen. You are chosen because you show the potential. So people all, all yeah, all that time he was spending sending headshots, he could have been working on his act or you know getting in better shape or doing something that would actually have some influence over the selection process, but people want, people just want the, they want, Oh, if I follow these three steps, I will get what I want. And that's not how it works. No, it's not how it works. And I think a, a, a blessing for me was not really having parents that were that interested in me or what I was doing, which made me then do a math. And my overall math was 
if they're not going to do me any favors, then why should a stranger do me a f- any favors? So I'm not going to rely on favors. <laughs> it's all going to be I'm going to create something that's going to be of benefit to them and then they will pay me. I, re- I relate to that. It's sort of like if you have very self-absorbed, indifferent parents, it's sort of it's like uh, like every every morning I, I go for a walk. I, while my wife sleeps, I walk the kids and I wear a weight vest. So uh, over time, you become used to the fact that you're wearing this weight vest, even though you're, you're getting strong. It's like resistance training. When you have parents who don't care, you end up having to work harder for things that other people believed was their birthright. And so I think. Uh, you sort of realize, oh, if I want to get noticed, I have to like really be amazing. Whereas if your parents had given you what you should have had, you would have uh, you would have you would have not built the muscles. It, you know, it was a very interesting contrast because my roommate did have a very doting mom and doting parents, and so it, according to his psychological makeup. And it's not a, even a critique. It's where you would logically be. You know, if your mom said, oh, look at you. Oh, you're so handsome. You know, look at you. You're so handsome. Or you're so smart. Or you're so talented or whatever. Then your mindset would be, yes, once one of these strangers sees my headshot, they're right, going to they're gonna get, they're going to understand what my mom understood many years ago. You know what I mean? Versus the other extreme with me, which is why should anyone like you? Based on, you know, a headshot and a resume, you're going to have to go over there and do something for them. And then they'll you're recognize gonna have to have it. something they want, whether right. it's a show or an act or a personality. You have to go earn it, essentially. Well, that is a, a good note to kind of go out on, which is everybody stop trying to talk people into stuff. There's way too much like you go. Here's why you need to give me money. It's like, just go do it and make them want to do it. What Make them want to do it for you. It, it is, wow. It's the only way to do it. The, the, talking them into it sometimes works, but that's basically one step removed from a bum going, you got 10 bucks? Like, that's, a, that's one step from that. I have a print on my, I don't know if you can see, I have this print right here on my wall, and it's a quote from Marcus Aurelius. He says, Uh, waste no more time arguing what a good man is like. Just be one. And that's sort of how I try to live my life, both professionally and personally. A great uh, note to go out on. And by the way, if you put on the weight vest, stay away from the pool. Just a a, a very real safety tip for Ryan Holiday. Uh, Lives of the Stoics. God, people, if you could be one thing, please be Stoic, male or female. Available for pre-order now. Well, it's going to come out tomorrow, September 29th. And uh, this is his 10th book, so I think he knows what he's talking about. The Daily Stoic Podcast as well. It's available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify as well. RyanHoliday.net is where you go. Uh, it's always so, I don't know, re- refreshing to speak to you, Ryan. Uh, I grew up listening to your stuff, so it's a total honor and privilege. Well, I'm so uh, glad that we can be on the same page about so many things. So until next time, it's Adam Kroll for Ryan Holiday saying mahalo. Congratulations. You're now a better person. And by the way, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this for you. Download more wisdom and inspiration next week on Take a Knee. This is Corolla Digital.